Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guests today are Kathleen Dean Moore and Tom Kearns. Uh, Kathleen Dean Moore is a philosopher and writer best known for award-winning books about our cultural and spiritual relation to wet, wild places, river walking, hold fast, Pine Island Paradox, and Wild Comfort. Until recently, distinguished professor of environmental ethics at Oregon State University, Moore's love for the reeling world led her to leave the university for a new life of climate writing and activism. Her most recent book, Great Tide Rising, Toward Clarity and Moral Courage in a Time of Planetary Change, follows moral ground, ethical action for a planet in peril, testimony from the world's moral leaders about our obligations to the future. Her newest book, Piano Tide, is a savagely funny novel about a small town struggle to defend its fresh water. Tom Kearns is Director of Environment and Human Rights Advisory and Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at North Seattle College. He's taught online courses in bioethics, ways of knowing, and environment and human rights. Dr. Kearns is author of Environmentally Induced Illnesses, Ethics, Risk Assessment, and Human Rights. And actually, from both of your both of your bios, I'm smelling some future interviews here. Um, he has lectured <laughs> at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva on human rights issues and HIV vaccine research, and has served as commissioner on the New Zealand People's Inquiry into Aerial Pesticide Sprays over Auckland. Tom also serves as a board member of Beyond Toxics and Concerned Citizens for Clean Air. He's a member of the drafting group for the Declaration of Human Rights and Climate Change. So first off, thank you both very much for your work. And second, thank you for being on the program. Hey, it's a pleasure, Derek. Yes, thank you very much. So I guess my first question is in, is in three parts. The first part is what's going on with fracking these days. The second part is what is fracking. And third, um, why are we talking about this issue in this moment? Well, let me take the first two, okay, Tom, and then we'll invite you to the third. Okay. Okay, so so everybody knows that the usual way of getting oil out of the ground is to find a pool of it and to put a drill down into it and to pump it out. But those kind of easy access pools of oil are gone now. We have burnt them up. And so we're having to turn to new, more extreme forms of extraction. In fact, a method now that's used by the oil and the gas industry to get out the fossil fuels that are already locked in solid rock. So what happens is that the workers push down these um, a pipe, and uh, into that pipe they pull water from all these places, like rivers or lakes or reservoirs, and they mix it with, with sand and herbicides and poisons and trade secret chemicals. Nobody really knows, although they know it includes hydrofluoric acid. They drill down maybe a mile, then they turn the uh, drills horizontal, and they might go out horizontally under the ground maybe a mile. And then under extraordinary pressure, they push that water mixture down into the rock and blast it open. That releases the oil and the gas, which they collect. They sell the gas. They collect the gas or the oil and sell it. They collect the, the gas sometimes, and sometimes they just flare it off. And so that's what fracking is. It's this extreme extraction method for oil and gas. It's um, it's fairly new, but it is taking off like gangbusters. Um, the United States now has 510,000 fracking wells, and they're producing more than half of our crude and two-thirds of the United States natural gas. Every year, 13,000 new wells. By now... 10 million Americans live within a mile of a fracking site. And um, the oil and gas production is increasing faster now than it has in any time in the United States history. Imagine that. Now when we need to be closing down the gas wells, they are increasing at this extraordinary number. So um, what, can, what more can we say about it? That fracking has made the United States a next net exporter of fossil fuels. It has made... 41 U.S. citizens into billionaires. And as a consequence, fracking has become a major producer of the money that powers political campaigns, a third of a billion dollars to Congress for the 113th session, and is creating a very lively market in legislators and industry regulators. Uh, what more should I say? That that um, there's been surge, a glorious surge in profits for the shareholders, and that includes, I have to confess, my retirement portfolio. And now fracking, as the industry says, it's the engine of the U.S. energy revolution. And I think that is true. Yeah. 
So if, what was the third question, Derek? Why are we talking about it now? Yes. Yeah, well, we have been talking about it for 10 years or so. But, um, you know, with 13,000 new wells every year, um, that's a lot more people who are impacted. So, you know, we're developing sort of a critical mass of, of impacted people and impacted uh, pets and livestock and uh, ecosystems and so on. Uh, the science is growing. In the early days, there were, you know, a handful of uh, peer-reviewed studies. So science takes a long time. So in the, in the beginning, there were just a few peer-reviewed studies that people could rely on to see if there were health impacts or impacts on water or animals, etc. cetera. Uh, but now there are lots of new, lots of studies and many added each year. So that's, that's probably part of it. Um, a growing awareness of uh, climate change and how fossil fuels impact climate change, and particularly uh, fracking because it's, uh, it releases so much methane, which is a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, it releases so much of it in the, into the atmosphere, some of that release being intentional. It's intended to be released. Some of that intentional stuff is burned, flared, but some is not. It's just, just let loose and out in the atmosphere to reduce pressure on pipes and so on. And, and, a, and a lot of it is uh, unintentional fugitive, it's called. So you put all, and uh, you put all that together and, and, uh, the conversation around fracking and climate change is just, is taken off. And, and we think it ought to have a, a human rights underpinning. So that's, that's why we're doing this. So before, before we go, Go on. Can can you talk a little bit more, either one of you or both of you, about the uh, some of the specific harms caused by uh, fracking to either the natural world or to to humans? Um, and we've all at this point seen uh, those videos of rivers that can be lit on fire. Um, can can you talk a little bit about whatever the harms are? Yeah, sure. Um, my sources um, f- uncover 900 peer-reviewed studies that are showing up things like toxic surface water, uh, contaminated groundwater. These chemicals, as they go down and as they come back up again, are leaking into the aquifers and into people's wells. Um, we're finding bulldozed landscapes, 100 um foot wide swaths across the countryside through people's crops, through people's yards. We're finding displaced families, um, people who um, open the door to find a representative of the oil industry saying, um, we would like to buy the rights to put a pipeway, a pipeline across your land. And then if you don't do that, then we'll just take it by eminent domain. We've got lost farms as a result. We've got earthquakes. Um, in uh, Oklahoma, the last two years have had a millennium's worth of earthquakes that would ordinarily occur in a thousand years. We've got respiratory illness. The list goes on. Rashes. Um, water scarcity is a huge problem um, in some of the world's most arid regions. They take so much water to go into these wells. They're now finding that newborns in the areas near the fracking wells have low birth rates and um, other health problems. We're finding radioactive release releases. So we're finding direct effects on human rights to life, liberty, and security of person. And I think, Tom, you, you'll agree that there's a huge outpouring now of outrage about the violation of, of um, procedural rights, too. The people who live near these fracking wells are not able to get information that they would use to protect their health and their rights. Um, they are denied hearings. The information is squelched. And there's a story about two six-year-olds who had a gag order that they weren't allowed to talk about what was happening in their backyard. So we're finding that there's this illusion, I use the word advisedly, between the government and the corporations to make sure that the information people would use to make rational decisions is not available to them. Boy, and that's just the top of the tip of the iceberg, too, because... 
the the procedural rights piece, the the outrage that people feel. Or I can't add this. It's just story after story of. Um, I, I did one of the presenters from um, uh, Alaska is going to be uh, telling us about her ancestral home uh, that her great 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 grandparents uh, homesteaded, and um, that now has a, a fracking well pad uh, a couple hundred yards away from it, uh, and they want to buy her land. Her neighbors have given permission to drill on their land, so that affects her land. She tells stories of people who have worked all their life in hopes of finally having a, a nice place to, she lives right on the uh, on the edge of the Prince William Sound, and uh, uh, looks out and sees uh, well pads out there. And uh, the, and so when, when that happens, one of the first things that happens is uh, property values drop precipitously. Nobody wants to buy a house near a, a fracking well pad. And uh, so that's, that's an, another very personal. So, so someone whose kids, for example, have gotten sick because the water, their, their well water has been poisoned now, and so they have to move. Uh, find out that they can't sell their home, at least not at a price that they can allows them to buy another one somewhere else. So it's just uh, there's just blockages everywhere. One of the big impacts that really strikes me is the use of water in in fracking. Each well and each fracking. So, so the way Kathy described that is there's a, a vertical well that goes down for a mile or so and then a horizontal that goes out from that. And there can be multiple horizontals out from any, you know, on any radius out from that central hole, vertical borehole. And each one of those can be fracked multiple times. And each time it's fracked, <clears throat> it requires several million gallons of water. 3.6 million. On an average, and sometimes it's up to 8 and 10 million. Mm-hmm. And... And all that water then is literally destroyed. It can't be cleaned up. It can't be refiltered. It can't be used anymore. So it has to be disposed of in a, in a injection well. And in an age when, uh, parts of the world are so water poor, um, including parts of this country are so water poor. And here we are destroying, um, the the limit we have a finite limited supply of water on this planet and we're destroying it and taking it out of out of circulation so just i mean you almost can't go through all the things that are wrong with fracking a good friend of mine um who does work her work is on aquifers um has pointed out to me that uh if you toxify a river you know at least the river can has a flow and there are things that can happen. But if you toxify an aquifer, although aquifers can flow as well, if you toxify an aquifer, it is essentially gone forever. Pretty much the case, yes. They take, uh, I don't know, decades, uh, centuries to replenish. So, uh, yeah, You've got two issues about water, don't we? One is um, all the chemicals that they intentionally put into it when they push that water down into the well. And then you have the flow back that somehow has to be stored, um, that water that comes back up. That includes radioactive materials now and heavy metals and hydrocarbons. And it's it's very difficult to know what to do that. And one of the things that they do with it is push it back down the well, store it back down in the, in the pits. And that, of course, brings it um, in contact with the aquifers in many cases. And many times they are storing it on the surface, too, which creates possibilities of space. So earlier, Tom mentioned uh, testimony. The word you said the word testimony or testify, and yeah. that brings up a, a question: that why is this testimony going to be in? And and more more currently, what is something that you both talked about? The Permanent People's Tribunal, and why is the per- Permanent People's Tribunal interested in fracking, climate change, and human rights? Boy, a lot of questions there. Um, the, the Permanent People's Tribunal 
is a descendant of the uh, Bertrand Russell Jean Paul Sartre Vietnam War Crimes Tribunal that happened in the late 60s, also an international tribunal put together by a couple philosophers. Um, and then the same Russell Sartre Tribunal a few years later heard another case on its, another topic in South America. I don't remember what it was related to. And then in the late 70s, um, it was decided that the world needed a permanent people's tribunal. So um, a collection of uh, authors and Nobel laureates and experts in law um, founded in Bologna, Italy, the Permanent People's Tribunal. Its headquarters are now in, in Rome. But uh, it's been around since 79, I think, and has heard... It's a human rights court, so that means the standard against which they judge any cases brought to them is human rights uh, law. So in that time, they've heard 40-some uh, human rights cases that have been brought to them. You, you, you petition them to hear, hear a case. And most of those have been uh, civil and political human rights issues like Bosnia and Rwanda and so on. Uh, but in the last few years, they've heard a few um, environmentally related human rights cases. Um, they've they uh, several years ago heard a case on on Bhopal. Their most their most recent one is the Myanmar Rohingya situation. Uh, and the reason they're interested is they had actually been interested before we uh, petitioned them four years ago, four and a half years ago. To, uh, to hear a case on fracking and climate change. So, what was the rest of that question? Why are they interested? Yes. Because <laughs> they can see the implications of, uh, of this. And uh, so, there's another piece of the question that I'm blanking on right now. Though. So, where will where will this tribunal on fracking be held? And who is sponsoring slash organizing it? Yeah, it'll it, it's it's going to be held nowhere. Um, it's all hundred uh, percent online, so um, it's being uh, co-sponsored by uh, at Oregon State the Spring Creek Project and the uh, Master's Degree in Environmental Arts and Humanities, both of which Kathy was instrumental in founding, and uh, by the steering group uh, for the program for the uh, uh, tribunal, for this tribunal session that has been working on it for four years. And so, the, um, so it's taking place nowhere and everywhere as things happen these days. Um, the the uh, tribunal is based in Rome. We have people who are going to be witnesses from Alaska, Australia. Help me here, Tom. Uh, Ohio. Uh, South Africa. Um, Scotland. Um, Vermont, Oregon. We've got uh, the uh, situation not far from you, Derek. Uh, the uh, Jordan Cove uh, LNG export facility that's trying to happen there. Those folks are going to be testifying also. So people will be able to go online and they will be able to follow the proceedings from the moment that the first gavel was struck in Rome um, all the way to the, the final um Testimony on Friday afternoon it starts from Monday morning through Friday afternoon. And Tom, where where can they access this? On the Spring Creek Facebook page, or equally uh, on the uh, PPT the the website we developed for this, which is tribunalonfracking.org. Big and, button there that says stream live. So. And just so we're clear, you're meaning, are you meaning Monday the 14th of May 2018? Yes. That is correct. Um, right. And, and it's video, right, Tom? This will be yes. right, right in, in, all its, in all its visual and auditory glory. Most yes. interesting. Yes, and recorded and saved and then and transcribed as well. And all the documents submitted to, there's a lot of them. Submitted to the to the court have are also going to be available, and all the video recordings and transcriptions of all the two hundred and some witnesses who have already testified uh, will also be available for 
everyone to see from now until, you know, eternity. And that's a really critical point, that these are going to be made available. I think of this as being a hearing in a very important sense, that since silence is so much um, a quality of the fracking industry, silencing, um, confusion, um, deliberate obfuscation of the facts, gag orders, non-disclosure agreements, there's so much secrecy around this, that a tribunal that gives people a chance to speak and be heard at a hearing is really a very, very important beginning point for a truly rational, rights-based discussion of what is going on around the world. So this, I think, is important that, that in one place now, in one particular time, uh, there will be available all these documents and all this testimony about what's going on. Yeah, those 200 people who have already testified, testified at preliminary tribunals, usually one-day events. We've had four of those. Three of them were last year, and one was earlier this year. And uh, two in Ohio, Youngstown and Athens, and one in Charlottesville, Virginia, and and one in uh, Australia. And they've all collected those 200 and some pieces of testimony, people standing up, coming from far away because they feel so strongly about it, um, and standing up and telling their story and having it video recorded and then transcribed and then summarized in a report and then all of that uh, submitted to, to the tribunal. And we weren't sure if people would actually want to tell their story Again, because they've told it, all these folks have told it so many times, and it just gets, you know, heard and then ignored. So they, they don't, they, we thought they wouldn't want to tell their story again, but when they saw that it was an international tribunal whose findings will be delivered to at least a couple UN agencies, the UN High Commission on Human Rights and, and the UN Environment Program. Uh, they thought this can can give them a voice, and and we also assured them that their their voice would be uh, stored here and available for this court and for future. This is a civil society court; it doesn't have the force of binding law. Um, but we expect uh, most people in this game expect that at some point courts are going to catch on that they need to. Uh, government courts are going to have to hear cases, and this can provide all the arguments presented here, all the evidence and the findings can provide uh, precedent. Uh, what there, we've got some law profs on our on our steering group, and they tell us that uh, this can serve as soft law, which judges can use to help them interpret. Uh, standing laws in light of new issues. So we're hoping this will serve future government courts also. So this is the sort of, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. I was going to point out that um, we're using the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the United Nations in 1948. This is an extraordinary document where all of the countries of the world got together and agreed. There are things that human beings do to one another that are not tolerable in a civil society. And there are obligations that incurred, that are incurred by governments and by non-state actors, which is to say corporations, which are morally and legally obligatory, a kind of respect for rights and dignity of people. So to have people take those documents, which are these marvelous moral guidances, these kind of moral compasses, and apply those principles to the facts of fracking will be, I think, historic. And I think it'll be a very powerful statement that, as Tom says, will reverberate through the courts and through people's narratives about what fracking is and does. It's not a normal thing to do these sorts of things to other people. And it's not... Um, it's not consistent with these norms of human behavior that are so widely established. Yeah, and maybe maybe this is a point to add on. You mentioned this earlier, Derek, about um, injury, harm to ecosystems, river drainages, and so on. Um, so while this is a human rights court, 
um, we decided that rights of nature uh, arguments and evidence should be heard as well. Um, so we have now scheduled to present um, five of the the very best earth jurisprudence attorneys in the world. <laughs> um, and we've, we've designated two hours on uh, Tuesday morning and two more hours on Wednesday afternoon for them to present their evidence and their cases. Um, uh, uh, Lisa Mead is the head of Earth Law Alliance in Scotland. Uh, Michelle Maloney is the director of uh, the convener, I guess it's called of the Earth Laws Alliance in, in Australia. And Linda Sheehan used to develop, uh, used to be the director of the uh, Earth Law Center in, uh, in down in the Bay Area. She's now with the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation though. Um, and then uh, the cell deaf attorney, um, Mari Margell is uh, gonna be presenting. And um, Cormac Cullinan, who's a, a, an attorney in South Africa, Cape Town, I think, um, uh, We'll also be uh, arguing that. So if anyone is interested in learning what rights of nature arguments entail and what their grounding is and what their legal status is, you couldn't find a better place to learn about that than from these two two-hour sessions because um, we, we told these five attorneys that the judges, there's going to be eight, PPT judges hearing this case, um, can be expected to be competent in human rights law, but they aren't competent in rights of nature law. So you attorneys are going to have to school them in, in rights of nature standards, and then on top of that, provide evidence and arguments about that. So this, this will be a fantastic place to get a quick, strong, from the experts, introduction to rights of nature issues. That, that's, that's a good point, and we should say that the schedule for the hearings um, is available online as well, and so that if people are interested in any part of it in particular, such as these arguments about nature's rights, they can zero in right in on them and get exactly what they're looking for. And Tom, tell us once more where would they would find the schedule. <laughs> Thank you. Tribunal on Fracking. Uh, it's a pretty the tribunal on fracking dot org. Uh, and my daughter tells me you have to say things seven times before she. <laughs> <laughs> she she told me that seven times. You know, as we're talking about the effects on on nature of fracking, I, I think we should really emphasize that fracking is a major contributor to climate change a major contributor to climate change. And Tom has already pointed out that, that <laughs> methane gases are, what, 83 times more potent in the next 20 years um, at holding in the, as greenhouse gases that hold in the, uh, the energy of the sun and heat the earth. Um, and those 20 years when the, when the methane is going to be most, in, in, uh, most present are the years when we're going to have to get this problem solved or, or not. So um, the, the effects of fracking on climate change are greater than the effects of their kind of cause, causative. Um, and we'll just, and I'll just say, I'll just say one more thing, and that is that that, that this, the sound of this, this noise of this um, fracking is is the sound of an economy that's rushing towards a precipice, and that that it's by expanding the availability of fossil fuels and by expanding the the presence of methane, they are pushing climate change in ways it has never been pushed before. And if you want to learn more about that, <clears throat> uh, the Spring Creek Project put together a bedrock lecture series uh, on uh, human rights and climate change. And many of the speakers, we, we brainstormed about which 20 or 30 speakers we would most really like to have and and then picked out, I think, 19 or 20 to invite, including Kathy, who delivered the first one. Um, and uh, those bedrock lectures, they're all mercifully short, 20 minutes or less. And uh, they're all available on the Spring Creek Project uh, Facebook page and on tribunalonfracking.org. Uh, and some of the speakers on there are fantastic. One of them, for example, 
is, uh, you, you know, the Our Children's Trust case against the federal government and, and climate change. Um, the lead attorney for that, Julia Olson, uh, delivered one of these uh, lectures and uh, Josh Fox and uh, Mary Wood at the University of Oregon and uh, several other folks whose names you'll recognize. So that's all sitting up there available for as a lead in to the uh, to the tribunal. If anyone thinks that this is a waste of time, that the fossil fuel industry is is powerful beyond any limitations, uh, we ought to call attention to the fact that France, Germany and Ireland have already banned fracking or put moratoria on them, that it is now illegal in New York state because of its health risks. That in Australia, it's going ahead in some ways, but in some ways it's stalled because of water scarcity issues there. So it is in no way a given that uh, fracking should be a part of the mix of our oil industry. And uh, it can, it is possible to make progress against even this incredible power of the fossil fuel industry and its unbelievable billions of dollars. One other piece to add to that is when we tell people about this tribunal and it's that it's a civil society uh, institution, not a government uh, court, they sometimes feel a little disappointed but because they, they think of uh, government courts as being able to require things of, um, of people and corporations. But... The kind of large-scale social change that has to happen in the next years, uh, just in, if we're going to face and deal with the, the climate issue, is not going to happen in courts as much as it's going to happen in the, the, the moral imagination of whole peoples. Um, major uh, social change from... Uh, women's suffrage to the civil rights movement to Vietnam War, major social change does not happen until whole communities, the, the perspective, the moral imagination of whole communities can be re, uh, reoriented to see that something is just plain wrong. And until that happens, there won't be big change. Right, and none of those changes that you mentioned, Tom, were caused by a sudden moral awakening in the federal government. They were <laughs> they were caused by people, as you say, joining hands and marching in the street and saying this is wrong. And so, so much of the struggle has to do with changing the narrative and hearing different stories. So far, the story about fracking has been a rah rah. Look how cheap we're going to make gas. Look how much gas and oil we're going to get. Look, we can have this time when we can make a bridge towards renewables. Well, the fact is that, that the world already has way more gas and oil than we can burn if we're going to avoid this terrible catastrophic impacts of global climate change. And finding more gas and oil, making it cheaper and, cheaper and more ubiquitous, is only going to make the situation. And we are way past the point where we can swap out bad fossil fuels for less bad fossil fuels. So the story needs to be told that this is a deeply destructive, deeply destructive technology that is violating human rights. It is taking down the life-supporting systems that support us. Um, My involvement with the fracking began when I read a statement by 500 scientists led by a team from Stanford who said, if all nations don't act soon, by the time today's children are middle-aged, the life-supporting systems of the earth will be irretrievably damaged. And I said to myself, okay, let's get on it then. Let's make sure that all nations do take immediate action and let's go first after the worst offenders. And I think fracking is identified as the most dangerous fossil fuel technology we've come up with yet. So I want to go back to something you said earlier and you, you mentioned in passing the judges. And so can you tell me sort of quickly, um, so, so here's how I'm picturing, and let me know if I have this incorrect, that you have the, the testimony has been assembled and pre-recorded, and then you're going to play that, and judges will listen. Am I correct so far? Partly. 
some of the some of the uh, testimony has already been it's all been submitted in in written form and in powerpoints that kind of thing um, okay but only some of it is pre-recorded a lot of it will be live and the judges will be there attending and able to ask questions of the presenters yes. okay okay great and then so the, so the the judges interact with the with the presenters and and then what do the judges what what is being asked of the judges at the end of the tribunal what are you actually asking them to do what are you who who is you i mean who is who is asking the tribunal well here i'm really confused okay who is asking the judges to do what yeah that's good originally 4 years ago when we presented this idea to the ppt secretariat uh, we wanted to indict uh, corporations, oil and gas corporations. We picked out a handful of them, and we were going to, you know, indict them for human rights abuses. And the PPT folks considered that and gave us sort of a provisional okay on it. But then we, uh, including a, a lot of law profs, uh, rethought that and decided it would be better to indict states, uh, governments, um, because governments are the the entities that have human rights obligations. Corporations don't, or at least it's still being decided in the courts whether corporations have. So so while it would have been extremely emotionally satisfying to uh, hate corporations publicly like that, um, we decided to indict states. And then about a year ago, uh, the person who was our lead attorney at the time, he, who who teaches international law, international human rights law, has argued before our Supreme Court, and, and so on, um, said that indicting like that would not be the most useful approach to this for future for use in future courts, and that it would be much more useful for future courts if we asked the judges for an advisory opinion on uh, uh, some questions. So we he he helped us formulate four questions that we want an advisory opinion on. And they're, they're, I can tell you very quickly what they are. One is, um, does fracking uh, breach any substantive and procedural human rights pr- that are protected by law? Uh, and then does fra- the second question is, does fracking warrant the issuance of measures for relief, like enjoining future activity, uh, remediation, uh, providing damages for harm, etc. And then the third question is the same thing around uh, climate change, and the fourth question is the same question around rights of nature. So we're asking the, the court to make a, a statement about whether these things violate human rights norms, and then secondly, a statement as to whether that justifies uh, some sort of remediation by the courts. One of the things about those questions that most excites me is this notion that, um, Tom, I think I think I'm right on this, that they're talking about the obligations, the human rights obligations of both state and non-state actors, and that the non-state actors would be the corporations. So one of the open questions in this tribunal would be, can we hold corporations responsible for human rights violations, or can we not? Um, and what about when states and government are working together in lockstep? What happens then? And if there are remediation or damages for the harm, are they to be paid by those people who are making extraordinary wealth from this, the, uh, or by the companies themselves, or do those are those to be paid by the governments? The the, the point that I would make is that fracking is so new and it came on us with such a rush that the law is only now catching up to what needs to be decided and that some of these questions are huge and basic and that they will shape the determination of damages and injunctions for years to come. Yes, yes, yes. And um, so much of the oral testimony at this tribunal will be uh, about about those things. It'd be, it'd be pre- people presenting stuff. But there's a session that the PPT judges requested. They call it a conceptual session. They wanted just attorneys, so we've got about a dozen attorneys, 14, I think, attorneys involved in this. They wanted a session, so we set aside Thursday afternoon for three hours with just uh, judges and attorneys to 
ask questions of each other and to have a conversation about how all this stuff fits together. I think that session is going to be fascinating because the judges are going to be asking for arguments around those four uh, questions. What what should we rule and why and on what basis? So that's going to be a really philosophically and legally and morally uh, interesting uh, three-hour session, I think. And will we have access to it? The whole thing is public. Great. Monday morning till till Friday noon. It's all completely public. There's a lot of movement in the United States these days about reparations, and uh, particularly around climate change. Uh, who's who's responsible for climate change? Who acted knowingly and intentionally to damage the um, prospects of people and plants and animals through burning fossil fuels? And then who should pay the costs of of um, adapting to it and also the uh, costs of remediation. And so these these are not idle questions. These are questions that are being debated in the courts right now. Yeah. Um, I remember when going to one of Mary Wood's lectures at the University of Oregon 10 years ago when she was presenting the idea of public trust uh, doctrine and how it should be used in courts for addressing climate change. And my jaw just dropped listening to that thing. Duh, how, why aren't we doing that? And now, uh, here we are, some years later, uh, the Our Children's Trust is doing just exactly that. Well, I heard her give a presentation at the PILC this last uh, law conference, uh, this last February, and it was about just what you said, Kathy, about reparations and who's responsible, and she has a plan for how to do that, how to address that, and my jaw dropped again, thinking... Duh, yes, why aren't we doing that yet? So we may well at some point. So this is a this is a fairly trivial question compared to the the, the profound things that both of you are saying. But for those of us who are uh, you know, the sort of dinosaurs who prefer to read transcripts rather than to watch videos, will there at some point be transcripts available of for example, that uh, discussion with the attorneys? Yes. <clears throat> All this is happening on Zoom. Zoom donated their software to us for a year. And uh, so uh, Zoom automatically does a transcript, so that means it's going to be of a certain quality. Who knows? Um, but we expect it to be very readable. And we've, we're asking, uh, there's a couple of law students in South Africa who want to help um, uh, correct it uh, as it's going on, so that, that will develop. And then, uh, in the long run, probably not before the tribunal is over, though, we hope to have an official a court reporter transcript that will uh, also be presentable, uh, you know, a legal a legal. Uh, recognized, certified uh, court reporter transcript that can be uh, available to future attorneys and judges and to the UN and so on. I just know for myself, I mean, yeah, I, I enjoy watching uh, some videos of good talks, but for myself, I always get so much more out when I can read it and sit on it and reread the sentence, go back to a sentence. Um so that's one reason we're doing that is just for that reason. Another reason is because there's so many time zones involved. I mean, there's people all over the world who are going to be uh, serving as witnesses and attorneys and judges. So uh, they can't all be online all the time that the sessions are in, in session. So uh, they'll want to, before their next session, they'll want to skim what happened in the last couple hours when they couldn't watch so, so have, they'll, they'll be available right away. So we have about five minutes left. And um, one question that's, that has kept coming to me is, um, I don't know how, I'll just ask it. So let's say there's someone who watches this tribunal and they live in Oklahoma and their well water used to be the best tasting well water in the world. And now they can't drink it because it, tastes awful and is quite possibly toxic and they themselves have a story to tell and is will there be 
is there a possibility of future will there be a possibility of some somehow people being able to tell their stories again in the future uh, oh yes um, one of the goals of this tribunal is to model the PPT has never done a fully online tribunal session ever and we of course haven't either so this is all new but one of its purposes uh, since it's less expensive and it can pull in the people witnesses uh, attorneys uh, judges from anywhere uh, is to model uh, how you do this so that in the future communities could put together a similar tribunal on their own and I would add to a, a couple more things. I have issued a call to writers, these eco activist writers who say, you know, how can I, how can I turn my, um, my written word toward this work of, of helping save the world from the corporate plunder? And I'm saying to people, you know, seek out the stories, go down to the fracking fields, interview the people, um, tell those stories in every form you can. We need our poets. We need our town criers. We need our, Journalists, we need our essayists, everybody out there telling these stories. Um, you remember Pope Francis was talking about all the silence and all the silencing around climate change. And he, he says, um, think about all the, the silent voices screaming up to heaven. And I think about that in relation to fracking, too. Your, your child is, is getting up every morning, bleeding from the nose and coming up with a rash and can't go to school and is in tears by because they're losing the farm and you're not allowed to talk about it because you're because you have maybe signed some sort of non-disclosure agreement we have learned in so many different areas of public life is that if you can silence your critics then you can get away with pretty much anything and so to be an instrument that works against the silencing i think is a really important part of all hands on deck telling the stories so that ought to be, when you're advertising this session, Derek, you, that what Kathy just said there, I think, ought to be the the, the quote you use. <laughs> so the the next the, the next to last question is um, so if people are moved to action by the human rights impacts of fracking and by this tribunal, but they don't necessarily have the stories to tell themselves, um, what actions can they take in addition to what Kathy just said? What else? What if someone is not primarily a writer? What if someone has other gifts? How can they use them in the service of this of this uh, discussion and in this 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 uh, transformation? Yeah, there's a lot of anger out there, and there's also a lot of indifference. And uh, people often ask me, you know, what can one person do? And my answer always begins: Stop being one person. You know, there are a lot of people who would have us believe this myth that by being more careful consumers, we can turn away from climate change. If we get the right car, if we get the right, if we get the right vegetables, if we turn away from buying beef, if we get the right kind of light bulb, we, by this transformation in our life as consumers, can save the world. That's not going to work. The best thing one person can do to act against these forces of destruction and plunder is to join up with other people and stop being one person. You know, I say at a city council meeting, one person is a crank, and, and two people are kind of interesting. But three protesters, now that's something. That's a movement. And now we've seen the whole halls filled with people um, protesting injustices and the, and the legislatures running out the back door in fear of the power of the people. So when we come together, that's when we, that's when we get things done. And one way to come together would be to, to watch this uh, tribunal or at least poke your nose in once in a while to watch it and, uh, and, and comment about it to friends on Facebook and start a conversation that way because uh, it's hard for anyone to say what, you know, I did, all the ideas of what someone else could do because we don't know what those someone else's skills are or interests are or background is. And, so what people want to do is bring together, bring their gifts and their skills together with other people with other skills and, and, uh, and work on it that way. So. Right. And the first step in that, in that kind of effort is often to go online and find out what's happening. What's happening up at Jordan Cove? 
Who are the groups that are organizing in resistance? What's happening up at the um, Keystone Pipelines? Who is organizing? How, how can I help them? How can I get on their listserv and learn about actions? So the last question here is, again, how can people who have been listening to this entire interview, how can they uh, listen and or read about the tribunal? They can go to tribunalonfracking.org or and to the Spring Creek Project uh, Facebook page about the tribunal. And there they will also see a, a list of six or seven or eight things that people can do to uh, respond to the question you just asked about what can they, what can we do? Well, I would like to thank you both for your work and for being on the program. I'd like to thank listeners for listening. My guests today have been Kathleen Dean Moore and Tom Kearns. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>